he appreciates. So he may or may not. Okay. And, and do you have a title for him that I should uh, know, or what? What do you do? You want to introduce him, or what? Um, I'll shoot that to you. And he, is he the uh, uh, student health director at San Diego State? Yes, public health director. Uh, School okay. of Public Health. So we'll have him kind of make, is it a he, is it? Is that right? Yes. We'll have him make some comments maybe after Nanja is done. Right, right. Okay. Thank you both again. I'll, I'll hand it off back to you, Dr. Welsh. Okay, well, are we starting? Yes. At 502. Go. <laughs> go ahead, show, show Tony. The American Lung Association has been saving lives by preventing lung disease and promoting lung health in our local communities for more than 100 years. And today, achieving health equity is at the core of everything we do. We believe everyone should have the same chance at healthy lungs and clean air, but we all know that too often those families with the most to lose get the least access to quality health care, the finest hospitals, and even clean air. This is one reason we've launched Community Connections free interactive conversation with San Diego healthcare professionals and medical experts on the health topics most affecting our communities. My fellow board member, Dr. Tim Morris of UCSD likes to call them dinners with doctors. For more information about weekly topics and more, please visit lung.org forward slash events. I hope to see you there. All right, well, thank you, Tony. Thank you uh, for all the hard work you have been doing over a, a, the last few years as a board member of the American Lung Association. We really appreciate it. Um, and thank you for introducing um, the Community Connection Series that we'll, we'll be uh, putting on tonight. My name is Mike Welch. Um, I'm, a, um, mem I'm a longtime volunteer of the American Lung Association and a member of the mission committee, which is the uh, committee important in putting on the connection, connection, uh, community connection series that we have tonight. Uh, I'm an allergy immunologist specialist with the Allergy and Asthma Medical Group and Research Center and Rady Children's Hospital. And I'll be hosting in place of Tim Morris uh, this evening. Uh, but before we get started, uh, we wanna thank San Diego's um, own Burr Heart and Lung Clinic uh, at Sharp Grossmont Hospital for presenting tonight's uh, uh, one of the, of the mini talks in our series, as well as the San Diego Foundation. Um, and we hope that this talk uh, is gonna help provide some information and insight into the various issues surrounding lung health uh, and uh, the issues surrounding the pandemic, of the COVID pandemic. pandemic. Uh, we, the goal is that, uh, is the goal of the American Lung Association is to improve and pr protect lung health. And this, uh, this talk tonight will be dealing with that uh, as it relates to COVID and its effect uh, with children. So um, before we go further, um, I wanna make sure you're aware that this is one of many in a series of talks being presented this fall called Community Connections dealing with the various issues uh, surrounding lung health. Uh, but let me now introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, Dr. Ram Shandar is a pediatric infectious disease specialist at the Navy Medical Center and also uh, connected with Rady Children's Hospital. And he's gonna be presenting our topic tonight, which is COVID among children, adolescents, and college students. So Dr. Ram Shandar, the uh, microphone is yours. Thanks for that intro. Let me share a screen here. Do you guys see these slides? Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so yeah, my name is uh, Dr. Ramchandran, another Ramchandran. I'm a pediatric infectious disease specialist. Most of my time is at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego, Balboa, but I'm also privileged at Rady Children's Hospital. That's what I did my fellowship at UCSD. I'll be talking to you guys about SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19. Um, and most of this talk will be about how it pertains to children, um, which thankfully has been uh, much better than um, the rest of us have fared through this pandemic. Just starting off, coronavirus, there are many types of coronavirus. They affect humans and animals. The coronaviruses that affected humans for most of history have been four types, 229E, OC43, NL63, and HKU1. And they usually cause a mild cold. It's the probably the second or third most common cause of a cold. Um, you might get cough, some runny nose, congestion. You may or may not get fever, more common in kids than in adults. Um, and very rarely causes gastrointestinal symptoms. In fact, in children, the four common types of human coronaviruses tend to cause diarrhea in less than 10% of cases. And that's very different than SARS-CoV-2, um, as you all know. The name coronavirus actually comes from the way it looks on electron microscopy. So this is a picture actually of coronavirus. You can see the body of the virus and there are these little spikes. Those are the spike proteins all around it. And that's actually how it latches onto the host cell. And those spike proteins, because they form this ring that looks like a crown, that's where the name came from, coronavirus. Now, when coronaviruses in other animals cross over to humans, it often causes more severe disease. Um, and that's really unintentional. Coronavirus doesn't want to be really fatal and lethal. It wants to just cause a mild infection, spread as much as possible, and move on. The first SARS-CoV virus, the SARS outbreak that you guys might remember from the early 2000s, came probably from a bat. We're still not 100% sure. And it was bad. It had a really attack, really high attack rate, which meant that it spread to a lot of people from single index case and caused a lot of morbidity and mortality. So the mortality rate during that outbreak was 10%, which versus SARS-CoV-2 is about 1%, depending on the population you're looking at. Interestingly, though, even in that first SARS-CoV outbreak, children were really not particularly affected. There were no infant or child deaths with the original SARS-CoV infection. After that, about 10 years later came MERS. MERS was in the Middle East. It probably came from a camel through another intermediary. Sorry, the camel was the intermediary um, from another animal. And um, the case fatality rate for MERS was really high, 36%. Thankfully, it was very self-limited. So the total number of cases was less than 2,000. Um, and then it seemed to sort of peter out from there. In both these cases, um, there was probably a bat reservoir and then an intermediary animal, and then it got to humans. And because we're an unintentional host, it caused more severe disease. That's probably true for SARS-CoV-2 as well. Now, the name COVID-19 comes from um, pushing two words together, coronavirus disease, 2019. That's the uh, abbreviation for that full term. And then the actual name of the virus assigned by the WHO is SARS-CoV-2. And that's because um, the shape of SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 is very similar, even though they're distinct. And so just SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2. So COVID-19 is the infection caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is a novel coronavirus, meaning that it doesn't, it's not supposed to cause infection in humans. It comes from another animal reservoir. We suspect that that's a bat, that it went to an intermediary animal, which we think now is a pangolin. And the initial cluster um, that was described were these 45 cases in an exotic animal market. Um, and so the hypothesis, the main one still is that somehow um, from this intermediate animal, which we think is a pangolin, a human got infected and it spread from there. Bats, for some reason are more susceptible to coronaviruses for a lot of different reasons. They feed on different animals. And when they give it to those, um, then the virus can mutate. And just based on genetics and strain types, there's a group that thinks they came from these really cute animals called pangolins. And um, they are hunted for their scales. They're really gorgeous. And they're very common to see in these exotic markets overseas. We still don't know 100%, of course. And there's a lot of controversy around that. Now, when we first started seeing these reports of SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19, the pediatric community was really worried. 
because we're used to being, we're used to children being more susceptible to new infections. And we're also used to children spreading it more. And we all know what kids are like when they're sick. They got their finger up their nose, they're all on top of each other, they're coughing and not covering their mouth. And so they oftentimes will suffer from more severe disease and then just spread it a whole lot more. And we were prepared for both of those things to happen. And as more and more data came out, it just seemed to not be true. This is the first, lar first large report um, looking at a population level SARS-CoV-2 in the United States. So this was last, not this last summer, but the summer before, published by the CDC. They described 1.3 million cases with a cumulative incidence of 403 per 100,000 overall. The highest case rate was actually in, in uh, adults over 80, 902 per 100,000. Juxtaposed against that was a really much lower incidence of children, 51.1 per 100,000 in children zero to nine years and 117 per 100,000 in children 10 to 19. That's not to say that kids can't get infected, clearly they can, but it's just far, far lower. And that's actually stayed consistent. Um, those numbers have varied as the year progressed and different variants came on, came and, and went and different surges came and went. But pretty consistently, the case rate in children seems to be lower than it is in adults. Perhaps more importantly, the, the likelihood that they, su they suffer from severe disease is also much lower. So in this initial report, the hospitalization rate in adults was 14%, 32% in adults over 80, but only 4% in children under 10. Similarly, the ICU rate was 8.5% in the general population, but 0.7% in children under 10. And the mortality rate was 5% overall, but 0.1% in children under 10. And in this initial report, just because we didn't really have a full grep over testing. So you'll still remember all of the issues around PCR testing around that time. These denominators are actually probably smaller. So those rates are a little inflated. That rate of uh, ICU admission and mortality is actually probably even lower in children. And that seems to be true in the data as we've gone forward. <clears throat> in San Diego, we actually looked really hard at children with SARS-CoV-2 and published this data, uh, I think back in May. And what we found was the same thing as the much larger studies. The likelihood of severe disease was lower. We found actually that a full 30% of kids had no symptoms whatsoever. And there are actually some studies that suggest that that number might be as high as 50%. Um, and we found that the symptoms were all over the place. So we're, you know, there was almost a classic pattern in adults, a loss of a, uh, sense of smell, maybe a loss of ability to taste, sore throat, and then progression of symptoms, cough, shortness of breath after that. Kids had no classic pattern. They could do whatever they wanted. Uh, less than two thirds of them had fever. Just over a third of them had cough. They could have abdominal pain, vomiting, diarrhea. They could even have a rash. Um, there was no single constellation of symptoms that strongly suggested SARS-CoV-2 infection. And the comorbidities weren't exactly what we expected either. Certainly children with lung disease were at higher risk, um, but that didn't necessarily translate to asthma. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the consistent risk factor in children and adults has been hypertension and obesity. Those seem to be the two things that really predispose you to bad disease, um, and then age as well. In that same vein, transmission, for whatever reason, children aren't the main engine of transmission. In fact, the people that are most likely to transmit the virus are young adults, 20 to 30 years of age. That's been consistent through all of the surges and all over the world. Um, when you look at like household cluster studies, there does seem to be um, a pattern emerging that children in a household are as likely adults to give it to their family members, especially their parents, which kind of makes sense. But outside of the household, especially in schools, that propensity to transmit virus really is much lower in the young children. This study published by uh, a group um, associated with the CDC looked at school districts in North Carolina when they had opened before a lot of us had, especially here in California. They looked at 77,000 children um, who were in person school and over a about two month period documented 773 cases. Only 32 of those cases were secondary, meaning that the transmission happened at school. Um, there were no cases of a child infecting an adult that they documented. And most of the cases of secondary transmission were where the mask use wasn't very good. That's really striking. Um, and it goes to show that even with simple mitigation uh, techniques in the school setting, 
you really can keep secondary transmission to a minimum. And in a lot of ways, the real risk is actually from the staff to the students rather than from the students to the staff or the students to each other. Um, and these are in young children, of course. In older kids, teenagers, so especially 12 and up, they are effectively adults when it comes to transmission risk. So a 15-year-old, a 16-year-old in close contact with SARS-CoV-2 is going to transmit just as well as you or I would. Um, when you try and describe children that are two, four, six, they just have a much, much lower capacity to transmit SARS-CoV-2 infection. And that is different than other viruses that tend to cause cold-like symptoms. Um, and that's even different from other coronaviruses that are adapted for humans. There is one condition that is very unique to children. This is the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children, MISC. It was originally called PIMS when it was described in Europe. And the first cases popped up in Italy when they were having their surge. Um, and then we saw it in the UK and then finally started seeing it here in the United States. It's a post-infectious syndrome. So most of the children that have this actually had very mild disease. They may have been completely asymptomatic, but two to four weeks later, two to six weeks really, after the infection, they start to get inflammation that's really aberrant, really high levels of inflammation that can affect multiple organ systems. Um, and this is all happening independent of viral replication. The infection, the acute infection of the virus is gone. Um, we were really suspicious that this might be something like Kawasaki disease, which you guys might have heard of before, but now the data is really suggesting that MISC is a distinct entity from Kawasaki disease. It's its own thing. Um, and the treatment is all anti-inflammatory. You're not trying to kill the virus, you're just trying to calm the inflammation down. Um, and there is actually MISA, so the, the, the syndrome has been described in adults, but it's much, much, much less common. MISC, um, the biggest study describing children with MISC was published, um, I think this past summer by a group called um, Overcoming COVID, which is originally the policing network, but it's a network of children's ICUs across the country. They described almost 200 children with MISC. They found the median age was eight years. Um, that's been consistent in multiple parts of the world. And while the children were very sick, about half of them ended up in the ICU, um, the mortality rate was thankfully very low. So 2% has been consistent in the literature, even beyond this study. A few other things were striking. When this paper was published, um, a lot of their data reflected the prior surge from last winter. So you can see those orange areas where it was really surging. Um, and that's where the majority of MISC cases were. So MISC reflects community prevalence, basically. And if you look in this chart below, the yellow line is the percent positivity rate of SARS-CoV-2 tests. And the lines are MISC cases. So you see a peak of SARS-CoV-2 prevalence, and then weeks later, the MISC cases come. And we've seen that actually with every surge, you wait a month and the children with MISC come a little later. Um, but again, thankfully there's, um, the norm has been that they fully recover afterward. Um, the CDC ended up looking at this and trying to just estimate an overall incidence. And they, they were able to conclude that even though the risk is real overall, thankfully it is still low. So most children with SARS-CoV-2 infection won't go on to get MISC. Okay, so this is a topic that's important for this audience, of course. And while we were worried initially about children um, and SARS-CoV-2, we were even more worried about kids with asthma. It's the norm to, that uh, any virus can exacerbate asthma. And certainly some viruses have more propensity to do that than others. Influenza, um, RSV, especially in the younger children, human metanemovirus. And we fully expected SARS-CoV-2 to be just as bad. But as the data started to pour in, especially from adults, it didn't seem that asthma in and of itself was a predisposing risk factor. They didn't necessarily get more severe disease. Certainly there were folks with asthma that got very sick. Oftentimes they had other comorbidities. They're overweight, had hypertension, they were very old. But by itself, no one was, we weren't able to show that asthma was an independent risk factor. In fact, now, if you go look through the literature, there are even some authors that would contend that asthma is protective. And I don't know that we can prove that. I wouldn't go tell anyone that at, at this point. But there is this hypothesis that's really interesting. SARS-CoV-2 need, SARS needs to use certain mechanisms to get inside the cell, the human cell. And one of those is um, this thing called ACE2, angiotensin-converting enzyme 2. And there's some studies that have shown that 
um, folks with allergic disease tend to express less ACE2 in the airway epithelial cells. And so it's possible that if you have uh, asthma or allergic disease, that SARS-CoV-2 may not be able to get into the cell quite as well. And I'm going to just say that again, that's a hypothesis. No one's actually proven that that's true. It is a little confusing too, because if you go on the CDC website, they clearly say that moderate to severe asthma is uh, a predisposition, predisposing condition, but actually there aren't really data to support that contention. So I'm going to tack a little bit here to vaccines and talk a little and talk about that because I think that's the bulk of the questions I've been getting lately. Um, broadly, there are three types of SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, mRNA, viral vector vaccines, and subunit vaccines. Now, we're really just going to talk about the first two because that's what's available in the United States. So this is the part of the landscape. There's actually many more vaccines that are either approved or in development, but many of those are in other parts of the world. So it's those first three that really are widely available in the United States. mRNA-1273 is Moderna, BNT-162B2 is Pfizer, and ADV-26 is Johnson & Johnson, or Janssen, they're synonymous. Now, the first two vaccines are mRNA vaccines. They have not been widely used before, but they've been in development for a long time. Actually, a lot of the studies that were ongoing were actually for cancer, so trying to make a cancer vaccine. So the technology is not brand new, even though the application was newer. Um, and really, it just goes to show that if you put enough resources, time and effort, um, and money, um, you can make amazing things happen. Between Murder and Pfizer, the data is sort of mixed, but they functionally are equivalent. They're just about as good as each other. For a little while, we thought Pfizer was better. Now we think Moderna is better. It'll probably shift as time goes on. And the concept is that you take mRNA, and if you guys remember from biology, mRNA is the part of, so you know, if you have DNA, you make mRNA from the DNA. mRNA goes to this thing called a ribosome, and the ribosome makes proteins based off the mRNA. So it's like a, a blueprint, basically. So the idea is you just take that mRNA, you put it in a little nanoparticle, it goes to the cell. Instead of going to the nucleus where the human DNA is, it actually stays out in the cytoplasm and it goes to the ribosome. The ribosome transcribes, it makes a protein based off that mRNA sequence and then releases it back into the bloodstream. So um, Moderna and Pfizer made an mRNA sequence that would transcribe a protein that looked like the spike protein on COVID, on SARS-CoV-2 virus. When that protein goes into the bloodstream, the immune system sees it, um, develops a response to it, gives you protective antibodies, and engages other parts of your immune system. And then the protein degrades. The beauty of it is the mRNA is not a stable molecule. It's going to evaporate and get destroyed over time. So if you just inject mRNA, it's not like the cell will keep making that protein forever. It'll extinguish. And it never goes anywhere near the human DNA. So I know a lot of people worry this sounds like genetic manipulation, but it really isn't. It's not doing anything to the human DNA. And it works. It's had really high efficacy that's been durable in multiple studies. Even through Delta, we have a lot of good data to show that it keeps you safe, keeps you out of the hospital. Johnson & Johnson is similar, but instead of using mRNA and a nanoparticle, they use a viral vector. So they take a virus called adenovirus, neuter it, and then put a different DNA sequence in there and use that adenovirus techno, um, sorry, the adenovirus mechanism to get into the cell um, in order to make protein that looks like spike. It works pretty good. It's what we would hope for. If the mRNA vaccines weren't so good, it would have been certainly good enough. And the advantage, of course, is that it's single dose instead of two. Um, but at this point, more focus is going towards Moderna and Pfizer because just over and over again, multiple studies have shown really good efficacy with a very low side effect profile. Um, and I think we don't have to talk about the other vaccines because Moderna and Pfizer are so far ahead of the others. Now, the question I've been getting every day from lots of people is, when can my kid get vaccinated? So Pfizer BNT162B2 is licensed down to 12 years of age. It has EUA, so it's not full FDA approval. Um, just so you guys know, from a regulatory standpoint, to get full approval, you typically need two phase three trials. Um, and so they gave the EUA based off a single phase three. 
it will likely get FDA approved eventually when there's enough data. But the way the EUA was um, justified for kids down to 12 is they looked at adults and these really impressive phase two trials that showed that it really kept you safe. It prevented infection, it prevented adults from ending up in the hospital and prevented death. They looked at the, the vaccine titers that were required for that and then gave the lowest dose they possibly could to kids in order to mirror that same vaccine titer. And they found actually that kids have an even more robust response. So they probably, um, even with a lower dose of vaccine are probably safer than we are and have longer durable immunity. Um, in, that, in that pathway to licensure, the FDA has to approve it. Then it goes to this independent group called the ACIP, which is a council of experts that are not associated with the government necessarily. They make a recommendation to the CDC and then the CDC approves it. So it's EUA approved for 12. Right now that process is going on for five, for down to age five. It's very likely that will be approved, but the FDA um, is on the cusp of approving it for EUA and then it'll go to the ACP and the CDC. So there's still a couple of weeks that will like one to two weeks, I'd say, where we still will not have final recommendations. And then of course there are ongoing trials for even younger kids too, um, but that will take even longer, at least a few more months before they're, they're available. I do wanna address myocarditis. I'm sure many of you have heard of it. It's worried you. Um, the risk is real, there's no doubt, but um, even though there is a risk, it seems to be very, very low. And there are many large trials, both here in the United States and outside the United States that have shown that. Um, this paper here was actually from a, a group out of um, Israel, which has just been on the, on the front of uh, vaccination. They were early adopters and they got their population vaccinated really early. This group looked at 2.5 million vaccinated healthcare organization members who were 16 and older. And they found that just 54 of them met the criteria for myocarditis. And myocarditis means just inflammation of the heart, okay? Um, so based on those numbers, the estimated incidence um, was two more per 100,000. So if you just take how much myocarditis do you have in the baseline population, and then if you vaccinate them, how much more myocarditis you get, it was two per 100,000, very, very low. Um, and it was slightly higher in um, males in the adolescent age group. So 16 to 29, that incidence was 10 per 100,000. And that's actually very similar to adult data too, or sorry, US data as well. So overall, the risk is very low. Just to even reassure you further is that the myocarditis cases have overwhelmingly been very mild um, and the return to heart function, um, even within a few months is, has been the norm. So um, even though there is a risk, that risk is very low. And if, if um, a patient does get myocarditis, the overwhelming likelihood is that they'll have a full recovery. This is another question that I get a lot, which is that why get the vaccine if you can still get infected? Um, so just to answer that question, of course you can get a breakthrough infection. I just wanna give you guys some perspective. There's no vaccine that's perfect. Even our best vaccines like MMR or varicella are in the high 90s. So no vaccine will prevent a 100% chance of infection. Um, and then actually many of the vaccines that you're used to like pertussis for example, are in the mid 80s. So it's all about shots on target, right? So if you have an 80% protection, uh, but you're exposed 10 times or 100 times, you're very likely to get the infection, right? So um, the intensity of the exposure and the repetitive the exposure will limit the effectiveness of the vaccine. So if you couple vaccination with common sense, your chance of getting infection is very low. There's also just the main point, which is that vaccines, the whole point of them actually wasn't to keep you from getting infected. It was to keep you from getting out of the hospital and getting severe disease. And the vaccines have consistently been very good at that. In San Diego, if you go on um, San Diego Public Health um, website for COVID, they'll show you what the risk reduction is of hospitalization here in San Diego. Um, and even through the Delta surge, um, you are 30 to 50 times less likely to end up in the hospital if you get SARS-CoV-2 infection, if you've been vaccinated. Consistently, it's very protective. It'll keep you safe. Now, variants are the thing that will make this all a little difficult. Um, and thankfully, Delta is sort of burning out. We've seen how bad it can be um, as more variants come about. 
And I first will just start with the basics. So a virus is a collection of proteins wrapped around genetic material, DNA or RNA. And the way it works is that hijacks the human cell and forces that cell to make new viruses. Um, and actually most viruses, you know, they outnumber human cells, they outnumber bacteria um, and they're everywhere. And most of them actually don't cause any disease. But in that replication process, it's really sloppy. And as they make mistakes, they'll get little errors that keep getting propagated. And those new viruses that are made will contain those errors in their, gen uh, in their genetic material. A variant is a new copy of a virus that results from one of these mutations. And most mutations won't affect the form or the function of the virus. But as you accumulate these mutations and the variants change over time, some of them might become more infectious, meaning they have more capacity to spread from human to human or cell to cell. And some might actually even cause more severe disease. And it looks like Delta might have actually done both, but that's just a function of time. So you're just playing the lottery as you get more and more mutations and cells replicate more and more, the likelihood that you get a bad variant becomes more and more likely. So does that mean anything? Well, first, let me just talk about kids. So far, we have not seen any variant that causes more severe disease in kids. Now, with Delta, it was a little tricky because there were a lot of breakthrough infections. There were a lot of infections in children. There were more children who were admitted. But the rate of admission, the rate of severe disease didn't seem to be higher. Um, and that was consistent in national data and certainly in San Diego. We didn't see our hospitals get full, or sorry, we didn't see the pediatric wards get full because of Delta. Um, but we certainly saw the rate of infection in kids go up while the surge was happening. So um, that's not totally reassuring because there are more variants that might show up in the, in the future and they may be more severe for children. They may cause more infection. And so the single most important thing we can do is to try and stop transmission. And that's of course really tough, but the thing that's gonna get us there is vaccination. As the vaccinated population goes up, um, the rate of spread will slow down, which means the likelihood of making more variants will slow down and the likelihood of a variant that really changes the calculus for us, especially as it relates to children and asthma might change as well. So the faster that we can get to a high immunization rate, the better. For those of you who have not been vaccinated already, who are eligible, I think that's super important. We are not out of the woods, um, even though the Delta surges come down, there are other things coming down the line. Um, Lambda, Kappa, whatever, we don't know yet. Um, and so getting vaccinated in that will help protect you from that. For those of you who are eligible for the booster, um, kids largely are excluded from this, but the CDC does allow moderate and severe asthma to be qualifiers. Um, and even though we talked about asthma not really being a severe or a, a, an independent risk factor, um, it doesn't hurt to consider getting boosted. Beyond that, just the same things that have been inculcated in all of us over the last year. Wear masks where it's appropriate, follow social distancing, use good judgment. And the things you'll think about are, what is my likelihood of exposure? What are my risk factors? And what is the incidence of, of SARS-CoV-2 in the community around me? Um, and that will vary from place to place, of course, and, and it will vary as time goes on. And that I think is actually my last slide. So I just slid in it 30 minutes there, Dr. Welch, like you'd asked very impressed with myself and um, be happy to take any questions. You, you should be impressed with yourself. That was excellent. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, and then not just being on time, but uh, you packed it in, you packed in a lot of information and it was perfect. It's what, what we wanted. Um, I have some questions um, for you as follow-up and we might be having somebody um, joining us, I'm not sure, uh, from Student Health uh, at San Diego State, but we'll wait and see on that one. Uh, I'm sure you uh, read the news today, I think it was, the FDA uh, advisory panel has given their blessing for approval of the, uh, the vaccine for this age group, 5 to 12. Did you read that? And, and do you think that's going to be something that the FDA will listen to and move it along to the ACIP? Very likely. Yeah, they, um, so they haven't actually posted, at least as of, I think, two o'clock when I was looking, hadn't posted the official notice, but they had published the data and certainly the lay news um, had picked up on it. Makes total sense. 
Um, if you go on the FDA website, you can look at their, uh, the data that was submitted by the company and it's very compelling. The vaccine effectiveness was 90% even through Delta. Um, the safety profile was really good. They saw no cases of MISC associated with the vaccine. Um, and uh, that is more than enough, I think, the FDA, for the FDA to approve and recommend it. What will happen then is it goes to the ACIP, which is the independent body of um, experts. Um, they'll make a recommendation. I can't see them saying anything different. And then it'll go to the CDC. And then it's just a matter of them approving it as well. And once all three of those wickets are passed, um, they'll start shipping out vaccines. So even within the next couple of weeks, we should be seeing um, vaccine out for children five and up. That's great news. Um, by the way, anybody who's attending uh, the uh, meeting, uh, please feel free to enter <clears throat> a question in the chat. In the chat box, if you have a question or a comment, please feel free to do that. And in the meantime, um, I'm going to ask another question <clears throat> regarding the uh, your experience. I mean, you've given national data. Um, what about what's the experience been with Rady's and at uh, the Navy Medical Center as far as um, the the complications of the vaccine or the the morbidity? Of the of the disease in our local hospitals, is it reflected and mirrored what we're seeing nationally? We've actually even had less severe disease than um, our colleagues on the East Coast and the South. We've certainly had children end up in the ICU. Most of those have been children with comorbidities, so especially adolescents who are overweight, um, children with heart conditions, that sort of stuff. Uh, knock on wood, we haven't lost anyone yet um, from SARS-CoV-2 directly. Um, we have seen uh, more than our fair share of MISC, certainly, especially with the last two surges. Um, but again, we've had really good outcomes with MISC as well. Vaccine related, um, we did have a handful of the myocarditis cases. Thankfully, all of them had a full recovery um, and they have been um, fairly infrequent, which is good. So that seems to uh, mirror the national experience as well. But we honestly, question. overall, we have not seen our hospital radies, uh, especially during the worst parts of the pandemic, our census was about half of what we would normally see. So um, kids staying at home and not getting severe disease actually was our experience. That's great news. That's great to hear. I think we had a question from Dr. Fuster. Do you want to Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask yeah. your question, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Um, and I, um, I really, you got a little bit into what I think does win out locally is just common sense measure locally being like among states or cities or whatever, just masking vaccines. Uh, that'll keep most of these variants away. But every time you hear, like we did have a Delta experience and maybe it wasn't different between children and adults very much in terms of morbidity rates, transmission, I, I'm not sure, but um, you made it kind of clear there weren't big differences, but have we learned anything in other countries? Because there's always kind of threats of Epsilon, Lambda. It could be one of the ones that gets us. And I don't know how it changes our practice, but just watching if something happened in another country in terms of rates and children, if there's data on that, I had no idea, but um, preparing for something else. just Yeah, it's been hard. I, you know, we were really worried about P1, actually, the Brazilian variant. So many kids were dying there. Mm -hmm. Um, but no one was able to actually establish um, anything more than a correlation. I think that probably has to do with the healthcare system there and confounding variables. Really hard to know. Beyond that, we haven't seen any variant that was worse for children um, that's translated here so far. Delta, we also weren't sure, um, especially in the South when the hospital started getting overrun. Um, there were a lot of folks that were worried that Delta was just intrinsically worse for children, but we just didn't see that here. And so that probably is more of a function of incidence rather than virulence from the virus itself. Mm. Got it. On the horizon, we don't know. I think it's just a black box. Okay, I, I have another question while well, some other questions come in. <clears throat> Do you think with the vaccination um, available now and, and we'll be administering to kids, do you think this school year we're going to have any change that's uh, in terms of masking and, and, and distancing and the various measures that the schools are implementing? Do you see a likelihood that we'll be changing that this year or will that maybe be next year or, or at all? 
I what, doubt what do that they'll think? make any changes this year. Mostly just the goal will be to stay open, which I think all of us are desperate for them to do. Um, and vaccines will help that. They'll add an extra layer of buffer, but it'll probably pre be premature to try and start paring back on all those mitigation strategies. I think we have to keep all of that together right now. Do you think <clears throat> the uh, way in which we're going to get the vaccine in kids is going to be different than the way we did it with the adult population, which tended to, and at least early on, be kind of massive, you know, uh, uh, big uh, places for administration? Do you think we're going to see that with kids, or will this be more of a local kind of pediatrician um, system? What do you, what no, do you see? One thing that pediatricians do really well is give vaccines at their visits. I think a lot of that will go that right now, just, and this is a good point. There's, um, there's really no reason to delay other vaccines. In fact, you should time them together. So um, kids that come in for their flu shot, they can get it with their SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. They can get it with the routine vaccines. So it might actually play out that the best chance of getting kids vaccinated is just part of the routine care. And there's been a whole effort for that. A lot of kids are missing their normal vaccines just because they've been staying home and the last year has been so much turmoil. So getting vaccinated against everything else that you normally would be is really important. I think your question is, is there gonna be like a mass vaccination center? I, I don't know about, about that. I, honestly, I don't have the answer. Um, I can tell you internally at Balboa, we're just planning on doing it through our clinics. That makes sense, yeah, that does. Any questions from uh, anybody, uh, put them in the chat room or raise your hand. Um, my next question has to do with exemptions. Uh, we, we, um, we've been dealing with this now with adults and, um, and grappling with um, patients who wanna be exempted on, on, on this vaccine. What do you think is gonna, um, what do you think we're gonna see with parents now asking for exemptions um, and what's gonna happen when they come to you? What's, what's gonna be your criteria? for writing an exemption? Not very many defined contraindications to the vaccine. Um, the risk of anaphylaxis with the mRNA vaccines was a little higher than we would usually see. So overall vaccines tend to have a one in one million chance of anaphylaxis. Um, and with the mRNA vaccine with Pfizer, it's probably a little bit more frequent. It's not, you know, the, the most frequent um, or the highest frequency that was quoted in the literature was one in 100,000. It's looking like it's not that frequent. So somewhere between there, one in 100,000 to one in 1 million. Um, and it may have something to do with this um, uh, polyethylene glycol that's used in order to make it, um, which is a really uncommon thing to have anaphylaxis to. So right now the defined reason to not get mRNA vaccine, so a true contraindication is anaphylaxis to a component in the vaccine. Um, and most folks that are going to ask for an exemption, it's not because they have any defined anaphylactic reaction. Um, and so I don't write exemptions for most people, actually. We have a discussion about that. And at the most, we might talk about a referral to an allergist to evaluate it. One of the other things you might consider is myocarditis. Certainly, if a patient has myocarditis that's related to the vaccine, um, it would be reasonable to not get the next one. The CDC says that it's probably safe, but it hasn't really been looked at prospectively. There's a number of cases in the literature of folks who had myocarditis after the first dose and went on to get the second and were fine. Um, but I think it's probably reasonable to consider that a contraindication functionally too. So for patients who have had myocarditis with the vaccine, I wouldn't expect them to get the second one until we have more data that it's safe. That sounds reasonable. Any other questions um, from uh, the audience here? Um, if not, uh, I think I think you answered a lot of the questions I had uh, um, related to children in this in this disease and the vaccine. Uh, thank you very much for the very informative pr presentation. Uh, we want to thank the Mission Committee of the American Lung Association the Burr Heart and Lung Clinic at Sharp Grossmont Hospital, as well as the San Diego Foundation for their support of community connections uh, here in San Diego, or as we like to call it, uh, um, talk with the docs. So uh, join us uh, next Wednesday when we will return 
with yet another talk. And this talk will be on the biology of COVID-19 infection presented by Dr. Snyder and Dr. Uh, Leibel of the Sanford Burnham Prebis Medical Discovery Institute in UCSD. But we'll hope, hope to see you then and good night to everyone. Mike, I, I just, you. sorry, Mark here. I had just one quick thing if we have time, just really sure, quick. Yeah, we do sorry. have time. And it was great. And I think we're just about done. I just, um, I had one pressing thing I keep hearing a lot and I heard it for a while there with just um, the, the sort of global, it's another global question on spread. And what one of the things that COVID's done is kind of prevent a lot of other vaccines globally from being given. An interesting one is polio vaccine and epitope sharing. And I just, I don't know if there's something about in kids that polio somehow has a bit of a sharing, like I've just heard, I've read some papers and things that it somehow can be protective um, and kids have higher titers and there's mucosal immunity and there's all kinds of immunity. It just, it was one last thing burning on my mind. I'm sorry to just ask it at the end here, but it's it was really interesting. Something uh, that might protect them. And it was almost a thought in adults for a while. And then the mRNAs came up and other things, but I just don't know if that's an important topic globally because these vaccines are only so available and et cetera. Yeah, no, it's really, it's really good. Actually, people thought about BCG for the same reason. Right. Um, and that data didn't seem to bear out quite as much. The yeah. answer is we don't we don't really know. It could make sense. You know, the there's enough, like you said, epitope matching that vaccines may confer some protection even beyond their defined um, target. Um, I don't know. I guess is the bottom line. We don't have okay. enough. Data. I just thought I'd raise it. I don't want to belabor. Mike was. No, it's really interesting. There are people that have discussed it. it the the it's, discussion around it has sort of died down weird. a little bit now that we have yeah. better options. Yeah, it's more of a global question. Like, you know, when they're only so available and there's, you know, issues that COVID blocks one and one might help the other. It's just really yeah. weird. But anyway, sorry about that. But uh, thank you. That was great. And, and thank you again, uh, Mike. Anything else? Uh, I guess that's the end of it. I think that's it, unless there's any other last last minute questions. Thanks again, Dr. Ramshandar. And um, we we definitely learned um, a lot from your presentation today. And, and again, I hope to see the rest of you um, uh, at our next presentation next week. So good night. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye.